Betty Fetters decided one afternoon that she was going to explore some of the back acreage that she and her husband had just purchased. And while she was out walking around through the trees, she suddenly found herself being hurled down an empty, abandoned well. As she was going down to the bottom, expecting instant death on the rocks below, she saw a white being of light come down from heaven, swoop down into the well, and the next thing she knew, she was standing on the ground beside the empty hole, unharmed. And you'll never be able to convince Betty Fetters that there are no such things as angels. Then little Joanna was only about eight years old. Her mother had just tucked her into bed, said their prayers, kissed her good night, and turned off the light, closed the door, when suddenly Joanna saw this beautiful white being of light standing in front of her. And this beautiful-looking angel said, Joanna, I'm an angel sent from God. Now, even though Joanna had been raised in a Christian home, she was afraid. And she looked at that angel and she said, You're not from God. And the angel said, Well, how do you know that? Because every place in the Bible where an angel appeared and the people were afraid, the angel said, Fear not. I'm afraid. And you didn't say, Fear not. You can't be from God. And suddenly the angel turned into this hideous looking monster that swooped down on Joanna and said, Would you rather see me looking like this? And then vanished away into the darkness. Sharon Lee Halstead, April 24, 1996, sitting across the table from the visiting pastor in the women's penitentiary at Salem, Oregon, said to the pastor, it was the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do in order to please God. She said as she left the green home with the gun still smoking in her hand, she realized that she had only halfway finished the job that God had given her to do. Lynn Green was dead, but her husband David and her son Nathaniel were only wounded and managed to escape. You see, Sharon Halstead had become convinced by an angel of light that it was God's will to destroy the Green family. Obviously, another bad angel. Betty Fetters. And the angel that swooped down into the well to save her life, was that a good angel or was it a bad angel? And the answer to that question is, you don't. No, if it was a good angel or a bad angel. Well, why would a bad angel want to save her life? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, because Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising that his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Why would he appear as an angel of light, swoop down into the well and save her life? Don't you think that Satan himself would save a life if he thought that by doing so he could gain enough confidence to win a soul? And that's angel Warfare. Revelation chapter 1. 
Revelation, the first chapter, the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus himself said, not only will there be spirits impersonating angels, there'll be spirits impersonating Jesus himself. And the book of Revelation is here to help us reveal and know who Jesus Christ is. The revelation of Jesus that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who testified to everything that he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The angel testified to everything that he saw. The book of Revelation was given to us by an angel. God uses angels all through the book of Revelation. First two chapters, letters from the angel of the church in Ephesus, the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the angel of the church in Laodicea. Angels are God's messengers to the world. But in Revelation, the 12th chapter, turn there with me, Revelation chapter 12, and look at verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, good angels, fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient dragon called Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him, angel warfare, demon angels hurled down to the earth. Revelation chapter 14, God's last messages for the world in the form of three angels flying through the midair. Angels are God's messengers, good angels that is. In fact, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the Euphrates River and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs and they came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons and they go out performing miraculous signs to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty unclean demon spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast the false prophet they're performing miracles and gather the whole world together for the battle on the great day of god almighty verse 16 says then they gathered the kings together to the place that in hebrew is called armageddon now i know that many of you came to Revelation now because you want to know about Armageddon. You want to know about the beast, the dragon, the false prophet, 666 written on the foreheads. And we're going to talk about these things. We're going to talk about the dragon. We're going to talk about the beast. You're going to know exactly what that number 666 is on the forehead and on the right hand. We're going to talk about Armageddon, the drying up of the Euphrates River. We're going to cover those things. But remember, we learned that the book of Revelation quotes or alludes to the Old Testament over how many times? Good job. You remembered 600 times. And that means that we have to understand a little of the Old Testament first before we can understand the book of Revelation. So that means that you need to be patient with me. Be patient. We're going to get to it. We're going to understand all of these things. I promise you. But what we want to do is apply the principles and to build one upon the other so that you can see for yourself what the Bible says about the beast and the dragon and the false prophet. The false prophet is interesting because a prophet is one who speaks for God. Therefore, a false prophet must be one who claims to speak for God, but actually he's not. And in order for a false prophet to deceive anyone, he would have to appear as though he were a true prophet. He would have to appear as though he were a true man of God. 
In fact, Revelation chapter 13 describes the false prophet as a beast with two horns like a lamb. He looks like a lamb. And he performs miracles, gathering the kings of the world together for battle on the great day of God Almighty. The false prophet looks like a lamb and he can work miracles. I want you to listen to me carefully now. If God works miracles, does he? Amen, he does. And if the false prophet works miracles, does he? The Bible says he does. Then miracles can never be the test that God is at work. And I think that a dangerous thing in the last days is the tendency for men and women to put faith and confidence in miracles as proof that God is at work when the dragon himself performs miracles, deceiving people into thinking that they're following the Lamb when they're not. So the Bible tells us in Revelation that we can expect to see a time when there will be demons coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, an explosion of supernatural, psychic, paranormal activity in the world. And I believe we're seeing this prophecy being fulfilled right now. Paul saw it in 1 Timothy. You can read about it, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in the last days some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Paul sees the time in the last days when many will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits. First of all, he's talking about the last days, and I want you to know that the more we study Revelation, the more convinced I become, and I think the more convinced you'll become, is that we're living in the last days right now. Paul was looking ahead to the time we're living in right now. And he saw many abandon the faith. Now, you cannot abandon something that you've never been a part of. And so people who were once a part of the faith are going to abandon the faith because they follow the doctrines of demons and false prophets. We're seeing, we're seeing that explosion of interest in supernatural things today. It's happening all around us. Favorite television programs from years ago, remember, Touched by an Angel, and I Love Genie that seemed so harmless, but dealing with supernatural psychic phenomena and paving the way for programs about witchcraft like Charmed that we see today, and, and Catherine Bell's new movie that came out last year, The Good Witch. I did a search on the Internet for occult, witchcraft, Wicca. And I got 8.5 million hits of websites dealing with the occult and supernatural phenomenon. All of this is just an indication that that's what men and women are interested in today. John Edwards' television program where he appears on stage, greets his spirit guides, and then begins to flawlessly relay information to the families eager to hear from their loved ones on the other side, information that only the deceased could possibly have known. Montel Williams. Montel Williams, in writing a endorsement for Sylvia Brown's book, The Other Side and Back, said in Literary Guild magazine, psychic, medium, clairvoyant, channel. Now, channel is one who claims to communicate with the dead. These are all words to describe Sylvia Brown's unique power, says Mr. Williams. 
I have personally witnessed her bring closure to distraught families, help police close cases, and open people's hearts to help them see the good in themselves. Now, what could be more harmless? I mean, who wouldn't want to help other people in these ways? Sylvia Brown herself said, this book is about you. It's about your God-given power and how to reconnect with it and how to put it to good use. Now, that should settle it once and for all, right? I mean, if Montel Williams says it's good and Sylvia Brown says it connects with your God-given power, that should settle it for us. Or does it? When he uses words like psychic, medium, clairvoyant, channel, that should raise a red flag for Christians. Another seer who lived years ago, his name was Isaiah, warned us. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19, when men tell you to consult spirit mediums, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Isaiah warns us against communicating with the dead. And today, people are flocking to different methods and modes of communicating with the dead, toying with the instruments of the demons of, of, of Satan, trying to deceive them into thinking that they're doing good when they're walking along a path to destruction. Have you ever heard of the book, The Sorcerer's Stone, about Harry Potter? You say, oh, no, not Harry Potter. He's just a little boy that wears big glasses that children like to read about. Nothing could be more harmless. Harry Potter. Popular beyond the author Kathleen, Joanne Kathleen Rowling's wildest expectations. And she said on the Diane Realm show, a talk show in England, she said one-third of her material is based on actual occult and witchcraft phenomenon. Is it possible that our children are being set up to follow deceiving spirits in the last days? Ten-year-old Gloria Bishop said, I like what they learn at Hogwarts school. I want to be a witch. And we're witnessing witchcraft morphing from the old hag stirring up a cauldron pot, flying on a broomstick, to white wicca, white witchcraft, and appealing to our children do you know what a sorcerer is? Look it up in the dictionary. A sorcerer is one who claims to communicate with the dead. Wicca is a nature-based religion offering its followers a connection with Mother Earth, which they often call the goddess. It claims that by tapping into Earth's energies and nature spirits, people can cast wholesome spells, perform white magic, and improve their lives. I noticed not long ago a news clip on television showing children in a school in California pledging allegiance to the Earth. And when I read about Wicca, Speaking about the earth as the goddess, the mother earth, it makes me wonder if the concern about the environment is being used for something more than simply protecting the environment. Don't misunderstand me. I believe that God created this world and he put us on this planet to care for it and we should be at the forefront of taking care of planet Earth. Don't misunderstand me. That if a devil appears as an angel of light, he can take good things and turn them into something not so good. And we need to be aware. Dr. 
Dr. George Barner, famous Christian researcher, says three out of every four teenagers have engaged in at least one type of psychic or witchcraft-related activity. Three out of four. Conversely, during the past year, fewer than three out of every ten church teenagers had received any teaching from their church about the elements of the supernatural. They're playing with it. They're experimenting with it, but nobody is teaching them the hazards and the pitfalls along the way. Who is it that the Sylvia Browns, the John Edwards, the Channels, the Spirit Mediums, who is it that they're communicating with on the other side? Once a lady was attending Revelation now in Tulsa, Oklahoma years ago, but I still remember her. She came the first night and I was chatting with her a little bit and uh, invited her to come back and she said well i'm not going to be coming back and i said why not she said you know about four years ago my husband died and shortly after he died i saw him again and he told me that he had been to heaven he saw god he saw jesus and they sent him back to talk to me and to let me know that as long as i continue going on like i am that when i die i'll be in heaven too so i don't need to study revelation i don't need to study the bible i got my assurance from the spirit of my husband now folks i want to tell you something loud and clear that this book was given to us by the spirit of god and if the Spirit is leading you in any direction other than into this book, then you're following the wrong Spirit. This is the only way for us to navigate the paths in the darkness of the world around us today. This is the only safety. The Bible says it's like a light shining on the pathway. But I want to talk about for a second another kind of Spirit or supernatural phenomenon some of you may have experienced or maybe you know someone who has hearing a voice warning you or feeling a force moving you out of oncoming disaster friend of ours was driving with her two little girls strapped into the back seat of a car when suddenly on a slippery highway she lost control of the car and was headed straight into a concrete revetment bracing herself expecting instant death for herself and her two little girls suddenly she found that she was sitting in the car parked harmlessly along the side of the road and you'll never be able to convince her that there are no such things as angels my father-in-law dina's dad was awakened one night years ago in the middle of the night with a distinct impression that his mother had died seconds later the telephone rang it was his sister calling him from the west coast saying that their mother had just passed away now, I tell you these stories not because they're so unusual, but they do happen. They happen enough for some of you to have experienced some of those very same things, or maybe you know someone who has, and in stories like that, they convince us without a doubt that there is a supernatural realm of existence, a spirit level, a level that exists on a realm between man and God, and furthermore, you and I were created with a capacity and a desire to communicate with the supernatural. The problem is that millions and millions are turning to the only kind of supernatural phenomenon they're hearing about, and that's the occult spiritism wicca and witchcraft the question is is it safe is it safe for us to be involved in any kind of supernatural or psychic phenomenon in the little epistle first John in first John chapter 4 verse 1 he writes dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirits to see if they're from God. Why? Because there are many false prophets going out into the world. Don't believe every spirit. Test the spirit. Notice the link between false prophets and the spirit, the evil demon spirits that work in the world. That's what Revelation tells us. The false prophet appears as though he's the Lamb of God to make you think that you're following Jesus when in fact you're following a demon spirit 
He goes on to say, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. The reason we need to understand the difference between the good spirits and the bad spirits is because it's the bad spirits that empower Antichrist and you'll never understand the Antichrist, who is the beast, unless you understand the difference between good and bad spirits. And that's why we're taking a little time to look at this issue. Well, some say, well, if that's the case and it's so dangerous, then I don't want anything to do with any kind of spirits. But that's not safe either because the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, do not put out the spirit's fire, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything and hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. So you can't just throw out any kind of supernatural phenomenon, but you need to test it. Test the spirit to see if it's really coming from God. Well, how do you test the spirit? The Bible tells us, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and the testimonies, if they speak not according to these, there is no light in them. The only way to test the spirit is with the word of God. Sometimes people tell me, well, I know the Spirit is right because my Spirit bears witness. Wrong test. You can't test the Spirit with the Spirit because the Spirit claims to be the Spirit of God even though it's a demon spirit. You can't test the Spirit with the Spirit. You can only test the Spirit with the Word of God. Well, how do you do that? What do you do if a Spirit or an angel tells you to read Matthew chapter 8 and 9. What do you do? You don't know if it's a good spirit or a bad spirit. Well, there's nothing in the Bible that says don't read Matthew chapter 8 and 9. So read it. Well, what if it's a bad spirit? Doesn't matter. Good spirit, bad spirit. Read the Word of God. And so you read Matthew chapter 8 and 9, all the stories about Jesus healing people. And the Spirit tells you God wants to use you to heal people. Go and pray for your neighbor who is sick. What should you do? You don't know if it's a good spirit or a bad spirit. What should you do? Go pray for your neighbor because there's nothing in the Bible that says thou shalt not pray for your sick neighbor. So it's okay. Even if it's a bad spirit, it's okay. But you see, the bad spirits will try to lead you with good things so that when you test it, you see that he squares up with Scripture and he gains your confidence and then asks you to do something contradictory to Scripture. And that's exactly what happened to Sharon Lee Halstead. Remember? An angel of light convinced her that she should go and pray for her neighbors, and they were healed. And she began to put more and more faith in that angel of light. At first, she tested it with the Scripture. But as the things came to pass, she relied more and more on the Spirit and less and less on the Word of God until finally she had so much confidence in the Spirit that the Spirit was able to convince her, Sharon, God has shown me that the Green family who are faithful, loyal Christians are about to fall away. And He wants you to take their lives now before they fall away so that they can be saved and you'll be doing the highest work of service for God and she had so much confidence in the spirit that she went to take the lives of the green family you see she should have tested the spirit one more time thou shalt not kill and she would have known that it was a bad spirit. That's how 
the demon spirits work. Even more in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. We are involved in demonic warfare. We're involved in warfare with spirits of darkness from heavenly realms. And the problem is that it doesn't even look dark because it seems as though it's the power of God. Now, some people say, well, I don't want to be in that war, Pastor. Too bad, you are. And you can't avoid it. All you can do is choose to be on the right side. It happens all around us. It happened to Jesus. He was constantly confronting demons. John saw it in the last days in the book of Revelation. Paul warned us about it. And even in the Old Testament, God forbid and warned us against being involved with demon spirits. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire who practices divination, a sorcery, who interprets omens, that's astrology, who engages in witchcraft, casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to God. Well, who would burn their children in the fire? That was just back in Bible times. And what's wrong with astrology? What's wrong with checking the newspaper to see what Leo tells me to do today? You see, astrology is based on the idea that your destiny, your fate is fixed by the position of the stars the moment you're born. But we know that we're born sinners destined for destruction. But when we meet Jesus Christ, we're born again, and our fate changes. Amen? But I've never heard an astrologer ask the question, when were you born again? Have you? When you look to the stars for guidance, you're turning your back on the God who made those stars. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. Let no one be found among you who consults the dead. Channels. John Edward, Sylvia Brown, and others. Jay-Z Knight, Yelm, Washington, claims to be a channel for a warrior, Ramtha, who supposedly died 3,500 years ago. And many of the popular stars pay thousands of dollars for counsel and guidance from Ramtha through his channel, Jay-Z Knight. She wrote in her book, a state of mind, my story, a little exchange that she had with Ramtha. Ramtha told her one day, I, Ramtha, am the enlightened one, and I know that I am God, and you do not know that you are God, but I know what you know. That's interesting. Jay-Z Knight said, okay, but right now I have to go to Safeway. Ramtha the all-knowing one said, Safeway? What's Safeway? It's a market where you go to buy groceries. Oh, what's groceries? Some God, isn't he? Why the lies? Why the lies if these are the spirits of departed loved ones? Why the lies? A lady whose husband had gone to war faithfully wrote, and the letters came back. The, his letters came in answer. But one day, his letters stopped coming. And the days turned into weeks. And she didn't know what had happened. No one knew what had happened to him. And finally, one day, some of her friends convinced her, he must be dead. Why don't you go to a medium, to a channel? And they'll be able to contact him, and he can tell you what happened. So she went to a channel, and she saw what appeared to be her husband. 
He explained how he'd been killed in the war. And she left feeling a little better. At least she knew what happened. But two weeks later, she heard a knock on her door. She opened the door, and there he was, unharmed. He wasn't even wounded. He had just been missing in action. Why the lies? If these are spirits of departed loved ones, why the lies? Why the immorality? My wife and I had the opportunity to watch a gospel film one night of two young ladies that had been involved in witchcraft, and praise God, he delivered them. And they told their testimony. And they said one evening, they were all standing together in a circle, nude, joining hands. Nude? Why the immorality? If these are spirits of departed loved ones, why the immorality? And the lady went on to say how she was filled with feelings of love and warmth and compassion while she watched her 18-month-old baby boy being consumed in the flames as a living sacrifice. And the other girl says, at that time there was only one thought that possessed my mind, and I wished that I had a baby boy that I could offer as a sacrifice to. It's only too gruesome to be told, but it needs to be told because that's where it ends. That's where spiritism leads. It's a part of the picture. It's a part of the scene. That's where spiritism ends. Now, how can that ever happen? How could someone ever do anything like that? Isaiah tells us how it can happen. Turn back to Isaiah, the ninth chapter, in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 9, verse 15. The elders are prominent men. They're the head. The prophets who speak lies are the tail. And those who guide this people mislead them and those who are guided by them are led astray. Now, why are these people led astray? They're led astray because they're following men instead of following God. What is the result? Verse 20 at the end of the verse says, each one will feed on the flesh of their own offspring. That's what happens when people turn to following men instead of following God. That's how it happens. And many today are making exactly the same mistake. Archie I. James gave up his pastorate in a black Methodist church and joined the People's Temple because he was impressed with the way they took in minorities and treated everyone equally in that church. Christine Cobb left her neighborhood Baptist church, joined the People's Temple, because there was such a warm, friendly, caring church, and she liked the way she felt when she went there. Ross Case, 32-year-old attorney, joined the People's Temple, impressed with their track record for civil rights in the community. And little Loretta Stewart, 16-year-old high school girl on her way to a high school dance, was enraptured by the music coming from the People's Temple. She went in and became a part of that fellowship because they loved her, they embraced her. The People's Temple was a friendly church. It was a warm, caring church. It was a safe church. A member of the Indianapolis, Indiana chapter of the Disciples of Christ, a mainline Protestant denomination. The pastor, young, powerful, dynamic, a man who had been recognized by the likes of Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, J. Edgar Hoover, and a host of others. He was appointed by the mayor of Indianapolis, Indiana, as the, as, as the, the director of the Human Rights Commission for that city. Ross Case, Loretta Stewart, Archie I. James, Christine Cobb, all 
love their pastor. And they followed their pastor, the Reverend James Jones, to Guyana, and were there when 900 people drank poison Kool-Aid because they were following the pastor. You see, when we follow a man, instead of following God, bad things happen. And the reason I'm telling you that story is because Archie I. James, Ross Case, Loretta Stewart, Christine Cobb were not weirdos. They were not some moronic branch of society. They were people just like you and I. In fact, I was in Portland, Oregon several years ago, and after this meeting, a lady came up to me and said, Pastor, Christine Cobb was my cousin. I said, what? She was your cousin? She said, yes. I said, what was she like? Was she kind of weird? She said, no, she was just like all the rest of us. I said, well, did you ever go to that church with her? She said, I did. I went to that church. Why didn't you go to Guyana with her? She said, my grandmother told me that the more she prayed about it, the worse she felt about that man. Thank God for praying grandmothers, amen? amen? They were people just like you. But they made one mistake. They followed a man instead of following God. And it wasn't as though they didn't have warning because there were times when he would preach things that did not square up with the Word of God. But when they asked him about it, he said, look, don't get hung up in doctrines. Doctrines aren't important. People are important. We need to love one another. We need to do caring things for one another. Don't worry about doctrines. You see, the false prophet is going to appear as though he's a man of God. He's going to know his scripture. He can quote it backwards and forwards. He'll read Bible texts to you. He'll pray for you. He'll heal you. The false prophet appears as a man of God. He could be a pastor, pastor of the largest church in town pastor of a small friendly church in town he could be your pastor you don't really know we can't follow men we have to follow god he could be a popular television evangelist he could travel all around the world holding revelation now programs that's right how do you know that you're not listening to the false prophet right now you don't know that. There's only one way to know, and that is to test what I say by the Word of God. Amen. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for anything. Take God's word for it. That's the only thing we can trust. I'm not afraid to put my faith to the acid test of the Word of God. Don't you be afraid to do the same thing? Amen. That's what this angel warfare is all about. Now, a lot of people say, man, I'm scared now. I didn't know about all that stuff. Well, I, I know we've been talking about some heavy things, but we need to unveil what's going on in this world. I want to shift gears now and close in these last few minutes. I want to talk about some better things, happier things. In fact, in Psalm 34, verse 7, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. So God has good angels. Praise the Lord for that. In fact, I'm going to show you that for every bad angel, there are two good angels here in the world. So you don't be, have to be afraid of the bad angels. Turn to Hebrews. This is one of my favorite ones in the little book of Hebrews, the first chapter. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? God has angels that he sends to serve you. In the Bible times, they saw their angels. 
Today, we don't see them. Why? Because I think maybe we're just too busy doing this and doing that and going here and going there. We don't even think about angels. I believe if we thought about it, if we prayed about it, if we spend time communing with God, maybe we can see angels just like they did in Bible times. Wouldn't you like that? God has angels sent to serve you. But I want to show you something even better than that. In the Gospel of John chapter 16 the gospel of john 16th chapter verse 7 jesus said i tell you the truth it is for your good that i'm going away unless i go away the counselor will not come to you but if i go he'll send i'll send him to you the counselor is the holy spirit and so jesus is saying that it's better for him it's better for him to go away and send the holy spirit than it is to have the holy spirit right here with us but to have jesus right here with us it's better for jesus to go away than it is for him to be here in person because when he goes away he sends the holy spirit now that doesn't sound like the truth to me but jesus said it is the truth and if it is then that it's better for jesus to send the holy spirit than to be here in person then i don't believe we have begun to experience what God wants to do for us through the power of His Holy Spirit. So I marked down a few things in my Bible that help us to understand how to tap in, tap into that power and wisdom of God. Well, hold on for dear life. I want to show you how to do it right now in verse 13. He says, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Do you want to know the truth? We all want to know the truth. I have never met anyone who says, I don't want to know the truth, tell me a lie. We want to know the truth. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. If you let him, if you let him lead you into the word of God, and then the Bible tells us in the end of verse 13, he'll tell you what is yet to come. Have you ever had to make a decision and you've asked yourself the question, if only I knew what was going to happen tomorrow? If only I knew what was going to happen next week or next month. Well, the Bible says he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, we saw that God predicts the future. Through the spirit of prophecy, he predicts the future. But I believe this is more than that. The Bible also says if we listen, we can hear that still, small voice behind us telling us this is the way, walk in it. God will lead you and help you to make decisions. You don't need a crystal ball, charts of the stars, tarot cards. All you need is the Spirit of God to lead you through the Word of God. And then there's more. In Romans, the 8th chapter, Romans chapter 8, a lot of good things here. In Romans chapter 8, look at verse 11 with me. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Now that tells me that the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead wants to live in you and to empower you. He wants to be in you. That means that he can be closer than father and son, mother and daughter, husband and wife. God's Spirit wants to live in you. You need never be alone again. So many people tell me, Pastor, I just feel so alone. But when you connect with the Spirit of God, he dwells in you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead wants to live in you. That's good news. Amen? And then he says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. God wants to empower you by his Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead wants to live in you and give you power. Power to break the chains of addiction. Power to break the addiction of drugs, alcohol, tobacco, any of the problems, pornography that people are struggling with today. God has power, and he can give you the power. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can break the chains that enslave you. That's good news for us tonight. And then security. 
The Spirit himself testifies in verse 16 with our spirit that we are God's children. You know, there's something about a sense of security we can have when we're God's children. Something about having a father. We have, my wife and I have two boys. Well, they're not boys anymore. They're all grown up and gone. But they were little boys. And I remember when they were little, they could be standing up at a high place, and I could stand down there with my arms outstretched, and they would jump off into my arms. They knew their father wasn't going to let them down. They knew they could trust their father. Well, if we can have that kind of security in our earthly fathers, how much more security do we have in trusting in the Spirit of God? Amen? Amen. He is your father. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That means that you are a prince. You are a princess. You are somebody in this old world. You can walk with your head held high because you are a child of the king. It makes you somebody. And then in verse 26, the Bible says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't even know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words can never express. We don't even know what to pray for. People tell me all the time, Pastor, I don't know how to pray. I'm telling you, there is power in prayer. God is not just up there and we're down here. He connects with us through prayer. And there is power in prayer. And God wants to work miracles in your life. You say, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, you don't have to know how to pray. All you need to do is talk to God like you would talk to a friend. You don't have to know all of those these and thous and wists and quists. Just pretend that you're talking to a friend, because Jesus wants to be your friend. Picture him sitting there with you. Talk to him. Tell him what's going on in your life. But you know, sometimes there are things that we can't even think of what to say, and that's when the Spirit intercedes with groans that words can never express. What power. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible tells us about the fruits of the Spirit, love. Could the world use more of that today? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I could use a lot more of patience, could you? I could use a lot more of all of these things. These are the benefits that you can have right now if you allow the Spirit of God to work in your heart. Do you want peace? Do you want rest from the things going on around us? Seek the Spirit of God. Oh, Lord God, we just thank you and praise you for Jesus who has set us free from the fears of demon spirits and the fears of things going on around us and empowers us to live a peaceful, happy, joyful life in him regardless of the circumstances. Lord, we want to walk with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a woman Help me believe In what I could be And all that I am Show me the stairway Lord, for